All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good day, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to the next uh, event in our webinar series. And uh, this will be a presentation by guest speaker, Dr. David Reitze on gravitational waves. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Garrett Cole, the technology manager at Thor Labs Crystalline Solutions in Santa Barbara, California, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Uh, Dave Reitze is the executive director at LIGO Laboratory and research professor of physics at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, California. He obtained his PhD in physics from the University of Texas at Austin, joining the University of Florida faculty in 1993 in the physics department, where he remained until 2021. Currently, Dave's research focus is on the development of ultra-sensitive gravitational wave detectors and gravitational wave astronomy, as we'll see in detail today. Uh, throughout Dave's talk, please feel free to submit any questions you have through the Q&A tool in the, uh, the webinar uh, portal, and Dave will be answering any questions following the presentation. So now at this time, I'd like to hand off the talk to Dave, and I very much look forward to the presentation. Thank you very much, Garrett. Uh, sound check, can I be heard? Perfect, yes. Good. All right. Well, thank, thanks again. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here as someone who has, uh, over many years, uh, been a big uh, consumer and customer of Thor Labs. It's uh, it's good to be giving this uh, uh, this webinar. So, so I'm going to talk about the gravitational wave revolution. Um, okay, there we go. And um, yeah, th this really is a revolution in the sense that we're uh, the field that has been created is now allows us to look really at a completely new sector of the universe. So, so for the next sort of 50 minutes or so, what am I going to talk about? Uh, so first I'll talk a little bit about gravitational waves, uh, what they are, why, why they're interesting, uh, why we spend a lot of time and effort to search for them and how we do that using precision interferometry. Um, and then we'll do a little bit of a deeper dive into uh, how we actually do the precision interferometry using the uh, advanced LIGO detector. And um, what's important there is that we're going to learn a lot about noise and, and how noises actually are the thing that you have to sort of uh, worry about and understand. And then I'm going to switch gears and go into um, uh, sort of highlights of the last seven years uh, we've been since the first um, direct detection of gravitational waves. And finally, I'd talk a little bit about where we're going in the future. So, so hopefully there's something for everyone in here. So, um, so what are gravitational waves? Uh, they are uh, ripples in space-time. What does that mean? That sounds cool, but what does it really mean? Well, to understand where they come from, you have to understand a little bit about general relativity, which is you know Einstein's sort of uh, uh, wonderful theory of gravity, which can be really encapsulated very nicely uh, in this phrase that was coined by John Wheeler. Uh, space tells matter how to move and matter tells space how to curve. What does that mean? It means that whenever I have uh, empty space, uh, if I put uh, an object that has mass in that space, it changes the geometry of that space. And the change in geometry is what manifests itself as gravity for other objects that are, uh, are, are distant from, from from that object. So, so there's this tight coupling between space, space time, and matter energy. And gravitational waves naturally arise out of that. Any accelerating object that has mass um, generates a gravitational wave. And, and as you'll see, the amplitudes of those waves are exceedingly tiny. Um, so, what really are they, though? I mean, I can say they're ripples in space time, but if you want to build a device that actually is going to measure, what a gravitational wave is. You have to understand physically what that gravitational wave is. And what they are, are strains. They're changes in length per unit length. So if you're familiar with, say, uh, an aluminum bar or something, if you put a force on it, you can compress it. This is a strain. The, the length changes a little bit. Well, that's exactly what happens with space time itself. Empty space actually can be strained. And there are sort of two polarizations, two flavors of gravitational wave, and they're manifested by these little um, uh, cartoon uh, movies here. So in one polarization, as a gravitational wave would be coming out towards you, say out of the screen, all right, one axis would uh, expand, expand, say the horizontal axis, while at the same time the vertical axis is contracting. Uh, and um, then as you go through a cycle, that just repeats itself um, again and again and again. The other polarization 
which we call H cross. It's just a 45 degree rotation, rotation of that. Now there's a lot of mathematics that, that, that went into actually, uh, uh, calculating what the amplitudes of these gravitational waves are, but it's, effectively that's what we're measuring. The amplitude is the, the change in length per unit length and the strain, we call that H. Um, so this suggests something about the measurement. It suggests that if you want to measure a, a, a small strain, um, you have to measure a small displacement, but it, that job is also easier if you measure over long baselines. So for example, if I measure, um, if I measure right near the uh, uh, origin of that coordinate system, the, the strain is very small, but if I measure uh, further away, the strain is very large. So that suggests that you want to make these measurements. You want to do the interferometry over a long baseline. Now, the challenge is that for the merging black holes, and these are massive objects, many, many times the mass of the sun that are very compact, you know, they fit in, uh, you can fit them in, in say the, the state of Rhode Island in terms of their diameter, um, they, the changes that we're trying to measure are 10 to the minus 21. So that's one part in 10 to the 21. That's a, you know, a trillionth of a billionth of, uh, 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 so that, that's a tough measurement to make. Uh, okay, so it's a tough measurement to make. Albert Einstein himself thought they could never be detected because the amplitudes of these waves are so, so tiny, even from the most massive objects. Uh, in uh, in the cosmos, so why why bother? Well, the answer is is that they are a new way to look at the universe. They're completely different from the photons, the neutrinos, the cosmic rays that we uh, traditionally look for to understand where um, the universe, uh, how the universe is made up, and how it functions. So they're completely new and unique. Um, Detectable gravitational waves are produced really by ultra relativistic systems, by the most violent astrophysical events in the universe. And in our case, we're going to be looking at objects, compact objects like neutron stars and black holes that are in tight orbits around one another, that are orbiting around one another, radiating gravitational waves. As they radiate gravitational waves, they lose energy, their orbit decays, eventually they collapse. Um, they travel unimpeded through matter. Right now, you're being bathed by gravitational waves, uh, the moon going around the Earth, the Earth going around the sun, many other sources of gravitational waves. Uh, but you don't notice it because gravity is such a weak force, it doesn't couple well uh, easily to matter. They travel at the speed of light. Uh, and the important part, and this is why we, we search for them, is because they carry direct information about the relativistic motion of bulk matter. If you think about what you what you see when you look through it, the lens of a telescope, uh, what you see are photons, and those photons are generated because of moving charges. It's you know, the, uh, the electromagnetic force. This is the gravitational force. So we're looking at matter as opposed to charge. And interestingly, and this is an important point, they fall off because we're we actually interferometry is a is a phase measurement. These ampli uh, the amplitudes of gravitational wave fall off as one over the distance, and that's actually very important. Uh, and it makes, in some sense, our job a little bit easier. All right, so what's LIGO? So we use precision interferometry to detect these displacements, that's the delta L, uh, produced by passing gravitational waves. So if you remember the diagram, I, the cartoon I showed you a couple slides ago, and you think about how I might make a measuring device to uh, actually measure those strains, well, here's what you do. What happens is the interferon, the laser goes to a beam splitter, this is a Michelson interferometer. Some of the light gets deflected. In fact, half the light gets deflected and goes vertically up towards what we'll call the Y arm. The other half of the light uh, goes transmits through the beam splitter to the X arm. And then as a gravitational wave passes, it sort of stretches and squeezes the arms. And in fact, what we're measuring here, and this is an important point, we're measuring the time of flight of light as it leaves the beam splitter goes up towards one arm, the Y arm, and back. And then we're comparing that using interferometry with the light that goes in the other arm and reflects and comes back. And because of that differential motion, when one arm is compressed, the other arm is stretched, that leads to a phase shift. So we're effectively, what we're doing here is we're transducing gravitational waves. So the sensor in this case is a simple photodiode, um, like one you could buy at Thor Labs. We, we've made some uh, modifications to make them a little more sensitive. But. So, so our baseline in this case is four kilometers. So that's a picture of one of the LIGO observatories in Hanford, Washington. There's another observatory 
uh, in Louisiana that looks very similar, except for the surrounding environs. Uh, so, all right, four kilometers, that's the length of our interferometer. So what does that say about the displacements that we need to measure? So that, if you do the math, um, basically, this tells you that you need to measure displacements to less than 10 to the minus 18 meters. Uh, how small is 10 to the minus 18 meters? It's really small. It's basically, if you take the diameter of a hydrogen atom and you divide it by 100 million, that's 10 to the minus 18 meters. If you take the diameter of a proton and you divide it by 1,000, that's 10 to the minus 18 meters. So, so these measurements are, are, are very tricky because we're trying to do them on Earth and because we're trying to measure such small displacements. So uh, we actually are one of a group of interferometers, the two LIGO interferometers in the US. Uh, we work with a, a, a number of other interferometers and I show them here. Our main partner right now is Virgo. We're actually starting to work with some other interferometers here uh, as a team. So we all sort of collaborate together. So it's not just that when I, a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about applies to LIGO, but it could equally apply to some of these other very sophisticated uh, interferometers. Um, so I, I said this, is a, this has been a long haul. Um, so LIGO really got its start about 50 years ago. Uh, gravitational waves were sort of ignored for the first 50 years of their, after they were predicted by Einstein because they were thought as, again, just too hard to detect. They were really a cute little mathematical uh, um, you know, uh, um, consequence of the general theory of relativity. Um, in, in the early 60s, a gentleman by the name of um, Joe Weber started trying to really build detectors that could detect gravitational waves using big, massive aluminum bars. Um, he was unsuccessful. Uh, however, he inspired other people, including uh, Ray Weiss at MIT, who started thinking about better ways to uh, uh, detect gravitational waves using interferometry. So this is a paper that was actually never published. Uh, it was in a, a technical report for MIT, electromagnetically coupled broadband gravitational antenna. It's basically an interferometer. You see the laser, you see the beam splitter, you see the end mirrors. There are a few other things in there that are needed to actually control the interferometer, uh, such as modulators, uh, there's filter filtration, uh, you have to control the, the, the positions of the mirrors and things like that. So this, this was the seed of the idea. And, and it led to uh, a, a rather long uh, path starting really in the early 80s, uh, where uh, this was proposed to the National Science Foundation, uh, went through a tremendous amount of, uh, of reviews um, to understand if it was even possible. The first time I heard, you know, you wanna try and measure something to 10 to the minus 18 meters over a four kilometer baseline. I, you know, I thought to myself, that sounds a little bit crazy. Um, uh, so, so it really got a lot of scrutiny. Uh, it was actually funded in, uh, in the late 80s and, and really got started in the early 90s. Uh, so the observatories that I just showed you at Hanford and Livingston, uh, it took us about uh, 10 years to get them uh, built and uh, get the, the first generation of the LIGO interferometers in. Uh, we built uh, the initial generation. Uh, we didn't see anything actually. Um, this co the total cost of that project was about uh, $300 million. Um, and nevertheless, even though we didn't see anything, we demonstrated that you could actually make these precision measurements uh, in, a, in a very hostile environment on the ground. Uh, and uh, uh, so because of that, uh, and because a lot of work had been done to try and understand a little bit more about where gravitational waves come from astrophysically, we were granted another uh, um, uh, uh, some other funding to, to build advanced LIGO. Uh, and we started that in really 2008. And since then, we've been operating, you know, building and operating the advanced LIGO detectors. And um, uh, as I'll go, go into in more detail, the first detections took place uh, in 20, uh, 2015. So, so this was really a very long struggle and, and, and it was a really risky project, but I, it's a credit to uh, you know, both the people who were working on LIGO in the early days and also our funders of the National Science Foundation who supported this through uh, through thick and through thin. Okay, so as a result, uh, Ray, along with uh, Barry Barish and Kip Thorne, uh, were awarded the 2017 Nobel Prize uh, in, in physics for the direct detection of gravitational waves, which uh, I, I think was a very fitting, uh, very fitting award. 
Um, so, so now let me go into a little more detail about the how we actually do the the, uh, the detection. Um, and again, I'm, it, we could spend a lot of time talking about a lot of the different parts of the advanced LIGO detector. So what I'm going to try and do is give you a, a sense, an overview, and sort of do a little deeper dive into some of the, the uh, primary components of the detector. So, so as I said, a gravitational uh, wave interferometer is a transducer. It basically takes ripples in space-time that pass through the detector, and it stretches one arm, compresses the other arm, which changes the arrival time of the photons relative to one another when they leave the beam splitter. And then that gets read out using uh, uh, photodiodes, actually a pair of photodiodes in our case. So what we're doing here is we're literally transducing uh, ripples in space-time produced by colliding black holes and turning them into photo current uh, uh, in photo detectors. Um, so, but to do that, you have to do a lot of uh, preparation of the laser light. So this is a, a sort of a little bit more sophisticated version of the interferometer I showed you before. Uh, we use neodymium YAG lasers. I'll say more about that in a minute. Uh, they're very highly stabilized. We have to actually modulate those uh, uh, lasers using a number of different modulators to put uh, RF sidebands on the lasers. And those RF sidebands are basically used to uh, sense and the uh, positions of the cavities of the interferometer. And you should see there are lots of cavities there. So the first thing you'll notice is that those four uh, kilometer arm lengths are actually Fabry Pro cavities, both on both arms. Um, we also have other cavities. We, we do something called photon recycling or power recycling. Laser power comes in. Um, that mirror forms a resonant cavity with the interferometer. That allows us to sort of passively amplify the light as we can in the uh, uh, Fabry Pro cavities. And effectively, we can go from uh, a laser that uh, when this slide was put together, it was 45 watts. Now we're up to about 100 watts, uh, really up to hundreds of kilowatts in the arm cavities just through this passive amplification. Uh, we also have another uh, tuning knob that we can use. It's called a signal recycling mirror. By um, uh, changing the reflectivity of that mirror, we, we pick one and we set it. But by picking that, it actually allows us to optimally extract the gravitational wave signal uh, from the interferometer. So in this case, what's really happening is we're directly modulating the amplitude. The gravitational wave is directly modulating the amplitude of the light. There are a number of filter cavities, input mode cleaner, output mode cleaner uh, there uh, that actually allow us to stabilize the light and make it in some sense clean enough that, that we can actually detect these gravitational waves. So here are some pictures. Uh, this is... Um, this is the first generation of our laser, and you can see that people are in a clean room. You know, the powers here are quite high, so we have to keep uh, ourselves in a, in a pretty uh, contamination-free environment. Um, one thing that's not shown on the uh, uh, picture of the interferometer is seismic isolation. This is actually a very important part of what we do, but it's uh, um, it, it, we, I don't actually show it on the, the uh, interferometer. The problem is, is that you have to... Uh, you have to ask yourself, okay, how much is the ground moving uh, when even in a quiet part of the world? And the answer is at one hertz, maybe a little less than one hertz, a tenth of a hertz, it's moving at about a micron, uh, um, you know, it has about a micron RMS fluctuation uh, in all directions, actually. And that's just due to the natural vibrations of the earth. It's amplified by uh, human noise, by anthropogenic noise as trucks drive by or airplanes fly over what have you. Uh, so we go to great pains. We uh, build active seismic isolation systems. These are um, basically they have seismometers, they have geophones in them, and they also are on the ground that actually sense the motion of the ground and then feed back and correct against it to suppress the ground motion. Here we suppress by a factor of, oh, maybe a, a thousand to 10,000 uh, from about one hertz to 10, uh, 10 hertz. And then the second part of that is actually uh, uh, using a, a something called a you know uh, suspension where we actually have the mirrors that are suspended by um, optical uh, basically glass fibers and here it's just a pendulum so the idea is very simple that a pe if you calculate the transfer function of a pendulum which is really a harmonic oscillator above its resonant frequency in this case that's about one hertz or so uh, the, the the motion falls off uh, as uh, about one over f squared so we use four stages so that 
you know, you can multiply one over F squared to the fourth power and that gives you one over F to the eighth. So collectively we roll, we basically take the noise that's on the ground and we attenuate it by a factor of about a trillion over a, a 10 period span. Width. So, so that's quite complicated. There's a lot of controls uh, that go into this, a lot of engineering. Um, it's really quite remarkable to realize that these mirrors, uh, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute, there are 40 kilograms. Um, they're held by four glass fibers, silica, few silica fibers that are each uh, 400 microns in diameter. That is the only contact that the mirror has with the outside world, physical contact. Uh, here's a picture of the mirror itself. These are really remarkable mirrors. They cost about $500,000 a piece through their processing from the, the blank to polishing the substrate to optical coating. I'll say more about the coatings in a minute, but uh, suffice to say the surface figure of these mirrors is uh, uh, about lambda over, almost lambda over 10,000. Uh, so they're, they're among the best mirrors uh, that, that one, can, one can buy. All right, um, so that's the interferometer, but uh, in order to make the interferometer work, you have to understand all of the forces that are in play that can cause the interferometer to actually see a signal. What shakes the mirrors, what changes the arrival time of the photons and things like that. So this picture is actually an important one. And I'll, so I'll walk through it here um, in some detail. So, so on the x-axis, you see frequency from about 10 hertz to a little bit more than maybe four or five kilohertz. On the y-axis is that quantity strain that we're trying to measure. In this case, in units uh, that are familiar to engineers, it's uh, per unit uh, square root of bandwidth. So it's strain per root hertz. Uh, to, so to figure out how much strain you're measuring, you would actually integrate over a bandwidth uh, um, and uh, take the square of that number. Um, okay, so what do you see here? There are lots of uh, lines on this graph. Uh, these are calculated um, uh, basically um, uh, limits to the interferometer performance from different kinds of physics that you have to think about and understand. So, so they sort of break down into, oh, and the other thing I should say about this, of course, is that lower is better, all right? Uh, uh, the, obviously, we want to measure strains as precisely as possible. Um, the other thing I should point out is that um, if you uh, remember something about acoustics, uh, 10 hertz to uh, a few kilohertz is actually in the acoustic band. So the detectors that we build on Earth are sensitive to gravitational waves that are in uh, actually in the, the, the band that we can actually hear them. And in fact, you can actually play back gravitational wave signals and they actually have sounds, they sound like chirps. Okay, so noises. Two types of noises that we really worry about fundamentally. There are also a lot of technical noises that I won't go into. Uh, the first are displacement noises. These are the noises that shake the mirrors. Uh, um, you know, and there are lots of ways you can shake the mirrors. I talked about the fact that the ground moves, the seismic perturbations, we go to a lot of trouble to suppress them. If you look on the graph at the brown curve, the one that's really over on the far left of the graph, going down very sharply, that is the limit based on our, uh, basically the way we've designed the interferometer that uh, the seismic noise enters. There's also something called Newtonian noise, which is actually a little more subtle. It's basically the fact that you can't screen gravity. I said gravity goes through everything. There's no way to build a Faraday cage or gravity or something that you can screen it. Uh, and it turns out that the Earth is actually moving macroscopically. There are natural modes of the Earth, for example. There are tides and things like that. But, but just generally, the uh, surface waves on the Earth actually provide a dynamic source of gravity that can actually push and pull the mirrors around. So that's that green line right there. Um, other sources of uh, displacement noise, ones I really want to I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, are quantum noise, which is photon pressure, photons have pressure, and then thermal noise. Uh, these basically, this is the fact that our interferometers are operated at finite temperatures, basically room temperature. And, and anything that has, operates at room temperature, statistical mechanics tells you it has energy in it. And if it has energy in it, it's moving. The atoms inside the mirrors inside the coatings inside the suspensions are moving and we have to worry about that you can see some of the noise sources here I'll, again i'll focus on the, the, the next slide sensing noise sources this is the other half of the uh, coin basically i told you we measure the arrival time of the photons all right if the arrival time of the photon is perturbed by something other than the gravitational wave 
that's a problem. And it turns out naturally photons are. Uh, there's something called shot noise. Quant we, we call that quantum noise in this case because photons are quantized. They obey the rules of quantum mechanics. Um, they, do, they, they are not classically defined in phase and amplitude. And in particular, the phase can vary, which mean, effectively means for us the arrival time of the photons can vary sort of as a Poissonian distribution. Uh, uh, so that's, that's one noise source. Uh, the presence of residual gas. If you have a molecule, photon interacts with a molecule. If the molecule is polarizable, that leads to a, a phase shift, basically macroscopically, we call that the index of refraction. So we have to go after all of these noise sources. And the ones that are really important um, are the ones that are in red here. So, at, and these are the ones that dominate the, uh, uh, the interferometer. So uh, at low frequency, uh, it's quantum noise, but it's quantum noise due to the fact that photons basically can kick the mirrors. A photon has momentum, when it reflects off the mirror, it imparts an impulse to the mirror. The photons are arriving at different times and randomly, so that's leading to sort of the stochastic photon pressure, which falls off in this graph is about one over uh, F squared, exactly one over F squared. Um, the, uh, the thing that you have to realize there is that the photon pressure goes as the square root of laser power if you actually calculate it out. So if I want to minimize the photon pressure, I just turn down the laser power. Right. On the other side, to the very high frequency side, above about uh, a couple hundred hertz, um, you have the shot noise. This is basically the random variations of the phase due to the, uh, the statistical distribution of photon arrival times. That goes as one over the square root of the laser power. So here, to improve this, in other words, to make that curve go down, you want to turn up the laser power. Uh, so, so you're faced with this sort of conundrum of, do I optimize for radiation pressure? Do I optimize for shot noise? Turns out that we use something called squeezing, we use nonlinear optics to generate correlated photon states that allows us to actually beat these fundamental limits uh, here. The other source that's really a problem for us, and I'll spend a couple of slides talking about it, uh, are mirror fluctuations. Um, this is basically, as I said, the, the finite energy in the mirror in the mirrors, in the suspensions and coatings, and, and the substrates themselves uh, are a problem. It turns out the dominant noise source there is in the mirror coatings. So when I say mirror fluctuations, that's really the coating noise. The fact that the coating is vibrating with very tiny amplitude, 10 to the minus 20, 10 to the minus 19 meters, but that's enough to cause us to uh, actually have a, a, a noise source that we have to worry about here. Okay. Uh, so. So let's focus in on that a little bit. So um, actually, this is a, a nice slide that I'll credit Garrett Cole um, with. Um, we use amorphous coatings uh, at finite temperature. So there's a picture of one of our mirrors, different view of it. And what happens? Well, as because it's made up of amorphous materials, molecules, you know, that are, uh, in this case, these, these coatings are uh, tantalum peptoxide and fused silica, uh, or, silicon oxide, um, you know, perfect wave fronts, all right, are basically reflected back uh, with some imperfection due to the fact that the mirror coating is vibrating. So that's the noise source. That is that red line that I showed you um, on the last graph. So, so how do you try and get around it? Well, here's the, here's the, the microscopic physics, and this is probably the most complicated slide that I'll show you here. Um, this is a problem we've been wrestling with for 35 years. We use ion beam sputtered amorphous coatings, and we, we use the best coatings in the world. They're ultra low absorption, they have about a part per million absorption. Uh, they're very uniform in terms of their uh, um, uh, stack composition. They, you know, they're very, very uniform over the large aperture. In this case, it's about 38 centimeters. Um, they've been specially designed. The coating has been optimized to operate for 1064 nanometers. Um, and, and they work pretty well. But the problem is because they're a finite temperature, they don't, they actually introduce noise. And the problem has to do with basically the internal friction in the coating. If I have a bunch of molecules that are organized amorphously, um, basically because they're finite energy, they're going to be moving around. And in some cases, you can think about this as, as flopping of, of oxygen in the bonds and things like that, depending on how the molecules are coordinated. So if I have a really stiff system, right, that has a really high quality factor, in other words, all of the energy 
is packed into a sort of a single residence or a single group of residences, that's good, as long as those residences are far away from our measurement band. But if I lower the cube, and I do that just by, in this case, introducing a coating uh, on the mirror, the substrates have very good cues, about 10 to the 8. Uh, what happens is that energy bleeds out, and it bleeds into our measurement band, and that's the source of the noise that you uh, that you saw before. So, so we spend a lot of time and effort, you know, trying to study. A, and I I don't work on this personally, but to try and study a, a a lot of different materials that would give us better amorphous coatings. And and we've made some progress in that actually. We've made some uh, good progress over the last uh, ten or fifteen years. But but uh, it. It may not be the best way to go. In particular, amorphous coatings are naturally sort of more viscous, you know, they have more internal dissipation than crystals. So you might want to solve this problem by going to a completely different kind of coating. And in fact, that's one of the most active uh, areas of measurement of uh, research right now is to develop uh, large diameter crystalline coatings. All right, these are basically coatings that are made up of uh, epi layers of uh, aluminum gallium arsenide. You can buy them commercially from Thor Labs uh, uh, and small aperture. The challenge that we face and some of the work that we're trying to do actually uh, with the help of, of uh, Garrett and some of his team is to scale these up to a diameter where they um, have the performance that we need at 30, uh, 30 centimeters. So uh, this is an area where there's a lot of active research. We've made some good progress on it. We're still getting to the 30, 30 centimeter goal, though we're not there yet. Um, say a few words about the vacuum system. Uh, it, it's a really remarkable uh, piece of uh, vacuum technology. It consists of almost 10,000 cubic meters of volume, uh, about 30,000 square meters of surface area. And it's not something that you can buy as one part. You actually have to weld the tube together. So there's about 50 kilometers of spiral welds uh, that make up this uh, vacuum system. And you can actually see here the vacuum system before it's when it was under construction, before it was covered. And those sort of uh, segments you see are actually stiffening rings on the, on the mirror. You can't see the welds themselves. And we have to get to about 10 to the minus 8 or 10 to the minus 9 tor, depending on where you are in the, uh, along the two diameter. And of course, there are we have two of these vacuum systems. So so uh, this is really a tour de force. And I can tell you, maintaining these systems is hard. Uh, we ha actually have had leaks uh, in these vacuums. Uh, and I can tell you, uh, trying to find a leak in you know, over um, basically 30,000 square meters of, of vacuum, uh, uh, you know, vacuum tube surface area is no, no small feat. It took us years to figure it out, but eventually, eventually we did. Say a little bit about the laser here. Actually, let me. I'm going to call your attention to the picture on the the upper right. Uh, it, you may not be hard. It, the resolution isn't very good, but hard to see it. But if you look there, you'll see a lot of things that say Thor Labs. Uh, we use a lot of the Thor Labs uh, components uh, in, uh, on, on the laser table there. The stuff that goes into the vacuum, which is everything beyond the laser, uh, that's all custom custom built um, stuff. So our laser is really a, a, a great laser system. Right now we're operating at about 100 watts. It's a, it's basically a, a, a double MOPA. So we have a, a frequency stabilized nonlinear planar ring oscillator. Um, and uh, we amplify that in two stages. We get it to about 100. Actually, we can get to about now 140 watts almost. This, this, even this slide's a little dated. Um, and then we have to stabilize the laser. So uh, we pick off part of the light. There's a reference cavity. Uh, we intensively stabilize the laser, we frequency stabilize the laser in the reference cavity. Uh, and then we actually have uh, more sophisticated ways of stabilizing it using very quiet cavities. Uh, this is that uh, cavity that you see, the triangle on the lower right figure. Uh, this is inside the vacuum system. Uh, the, uh, it's the nuclear filter cavity. So so collectively, this the, the, the power noise, the, if you will, the RIN, the uh, relative intensity noise, is about 10 to the minus 7 watts per per root hertz at 10 hertz, and that's quite good. Uh, the frequency noise uh, just out of the laser itself is about ten is about a tenth of a hertz per root hertz, and that's also quite good. Ultimately, the stabilization is um, uh, controlled by the arm cavities in the interferometer itself, and it's much, much better than, than, than that. But anyway, just on its own, this is a very, uh, you know, a, a very nice uh, and robust laser. It operates day in and day out. We have hundreds of thousands of hours of operation on these systems. You know, there's maintenance that's required, of course. 
uh, and you put it all together and it all works great. Uh, this is a, the latest uh, um, sensitivity curve. And you can see that uh, if you remember the curve I showed you before, it doesn't look exactly like it, but that has the same features. It goes up at low frequency, rolls up at high frequency. That's due to a filter in the cavity, pro cavity. Uh, and we get to better than 10 to the minus 23 hertz per recurrence. Okay, let me switch gears now in the remaining time I have left and talk a little bit about some of the astrophysics um, that we're motivated to do by you know, these great detectors. Uh, so there, uh, let me start by sort of saying, well, gravitational waves. I sort of introduced them. What are they good for? But what are the things that you can really do with them? What are the big fundamental questions that can be uh, addressed here? And and they're, they sort of break down into five or six. There are many sort of uh, more detailed questions you can ask, but let's look at them at a very high level. So the first question you can ask, which is maybe the hardest, is where does general relativity break down? So general relativity makes very specific predictions about the nature of space-time, about how objects interact through um, uh, geometry. Uh, it predicts black holes. It, it, it is, in some sense, the basis for uh, some of the what we understand in cosmology and the big Big Bang. So there's lots of predictions, that, and they've all been proven to be true uh, since Einstein first came up with the theory. Does it break down? Well, it might, because we know fundamentally quantum mechanics and general relativity don't actually agree with one another. There's no unified field theory. Uh, so maybe in the regimes that we test gravity, which are the most extreme regimes that one can find when black holes are colliding, uh, we can actually test that. We can also look at black holes themselves. Uh, what Are they truly black holes that were predicted by Albert Einstein, or are they more complicated? Maybe the kinds of black holes that Hawking uh, talks about that are talked about now uh, by, by some of the practitioners of, of uh, string theory. You know, is there a quantum nature to black holes? If there is, we might be able to see it. I will tell you personally, I think these first two things that I've just talked about, where does GR break down and are, are black holes uh, quantum or, or classical? I think these are very hard questions. I don't know if we'll be able to answer them, but 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 we're in a regime that no one else has looked at, so that's important. Uh, the next one is how does matter ex uh, behave under extreme conditions? I'll say more about this uh, in a few slides, but basically we can probe massive objects such as neutron stars, which you know, are as massive as the sun, but very compact, you know, a kilometer, 25 kilometers in diameter, colliding with each other relativistically. So this is like, you know, the, the, the uh, a universal atom smasher for you. Basically, you're taking these giant atomic nuclei. They're made up of neutrons, mostly, and protons, and colliding them together relativistically, but with you know uh, objects that are the you know uh, nuclei, if you will, that are the mass of the of the sun, and even more than the mass of the sun. So there's lots of interesting information one can get out of that, including how neutrons behave under extreme conditions. Uh, where do heavy elements come from? Uh, this is something I'll say more about in a minute. We know that stars are the foundries for a lot of the elements. We know that the Big Bang was the foundry for hydrogen and, and a bit of helium. But the heaviest elements, gold, silver, platinum, uranium, where do they come from? It turns out that they come from the collisions of neutron stars. And we've, we've actually shown that. We, uh, collaborators have shown that. How do massive stars explode? We still don't understand all of the physics of supernova explosions. Maybe we can get at that through um, uh, through gravitational wave observations if the explosion produces gravitational waves. That's not necessarily a guarantee, but if the star has some asymmetric, if it's spinning, if the mass distribution is asymmetric, we'll see, we might be able to see that. Uh, can we find clues to the nature of dark matter and dark energy? These are outstanding questions. Dark matter goes back almost 100 years. Dark energy is more recent, about 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Um, a lot of people, a lot of physicists are working very hard to understand this because dark matter is matter. It gravitates. Maybe we can see that. Uh, um, it may be that, that uh, black holes, you know, primordial black holes make up some dark matter. So hopefully we will be able to see it. And then, of course, you know, if you build a new machine that you're looking at a new part of the universe, um, what else is out there that we don't know? So this, this is really, this would be the most exciting thing to discover something that no one actually thought about or predicted. Um, so, so let me just highlight a couple of things that we've done uh, um, over the last uh, seven years. So, so the first detection uh, of uh, uh, gravitational waves was 
um, this wonderful signal that was produced really literally after we first turned on our machines. So about a day after we started operating Advanced LIGO, we saw this beautiful signal that you can see in that lower left plot there. Those squiggles uh, are basically the signals that came out of the Hanford interferometer in red and the Livingston interferometer in blue. Uh, and you can actually see that they're quite, quite, they, they look exactly alike. That tells you that the signal that you're seeing is probably not, in fact, is most definitely not from some other perturbation, but it's really truly a gravitational wave signal. Moreover, you can extract from those waveforms a lot of information about the nature of the objects that produce the gravitational wave. In this case, it was two roughly full 30 solar mass black holes that were orbiting and colliding around one another. They're about a billion, 1.3 billion light years away. So it took 1.3 billion light years for the signal to get to our detectors. Fortunately, we turned our detectors on a day before that signal arrived. Uh, and we were able to uh, to detect them. So that was really a remarkable uh, event. And that was actually the event that led to uh, the awarding of the Nobel Prize um, to Ray Weiss and Barry and Ken. Um, uh, uh, equally, and perhaps even more spectacular uh, detection came about two years later when we detected what we all thought we were going to detect. People were, you know, there was a question about whether even binary black hole systems existed. The astrophysics is such that they should exist, but there are reasons to you know, think that they may not be able to exist. Well, now we know they do. Um, uh, so what about neutron stars? Well, we've known for a long time that binary neutron stars exist. In fact, there was a Nobel Prize awarded to uh, Joe Taylor and Russell Hulse for actually indirectly measuring the decay, orbital decay of two neutron stars uh, through the emission of gravitational waves. That was in 1992, if I remember correctly. Right, so we were able to detect that directly uh, on August 17th. But what was really remarkable about that is at the same time we were detecting our gravitational waves with the two LIGO detectors, you can see the data. Actually, you don't see anything in Virgo. That's actually a, an important piece of the puzzle that tells you something about where the object is. Um, our friends who were operating uh, telescopes, space telescopes looking for gamma rays detected about two seconds later a, a gamma ray burst from the same region in the sky to within a few degrees, actually to within about 20 degrees or so. And because of these coincident events, and it's long been postulated that colliding neutron stars produce beamed gamma rays that if they're oriented in the right direction would hit, hit the Earth, this was sort of a, a, a real um, all you know, fire alarm for us. Basically we said, oh my gosh, we've detected a neutron star and a, a gamma ray. Uh, so we were able to actually issue uh, what we call an alert. Basically, we sent out a, a message to everybody who operates telescopes all over the planet, and including space telescopes, um, and said, look at this galaxy, which happened to be about 130 million light years away, which is very close from a cosmic perspective. And that little dot that you see in the, the optical image there is basically the growth of the light of the remnant of those two neutron stars. So this is called a kilonova. Actually, after those two neutron stars collided, uh, neutrons went everywhere. In that process, basically, they produce a huge amount of light, mostly in the infrared, a little bit in the blue. It's, it's very time dependent. And by monitoring the spectra of those, um, uh, of, of the light over a period of days, weeks, and even months, looking in radio. We looked at radio, well, we didn't, but our friends who operate telescopes did look at radio, uh, X-ray, gamma ray, uh, uh, infrared. We're able to actually come up with a confirmation that heavy elements, uh, that's basically all the elements that you see in the periodic table that are in yellow there, um, are, are really born, maybe not everywhere in the universe, but a large fraction of them are born from these collisions of neutron stars. So that's, that was actually a major, major finding. And I would not be surprised if there's another Nobel Prize in that discovery at some point. So we've been running for, like I said, seven years. We've detected um, right now about uh, 90, almost 100 of these gravitational wave events. Mostly we see black holes. Uh, so all those blue dots you see on this graph uh, are black holes. And we, you know, when we detect them, we get three of them. We see the two 
progenitors that merge and form the final black hole. They release energy in that process. Uh, the orange dots are neutron stars. The ones that have question marks are ones that fall in a place where we don't know what they are. They could be neutron stars, they could be black holes. The astrophysics isn't solid enough to tell us what, what's going on there, but we hope with further observations as we go forward that we'll be able to pin down the nature of these objects in this area between about two and three or four solar masses, we call it, in that scale. Um, this one I'll be very quick because I want to leave time for questions. Um, our last run, unfortunately, was interrupted early because of when the pandemic hit, but, but we discovered a, a really interesting object. In fact, it's the most massive intermediate mass black hole, not a supermassive black hole like you see in the center of galaxies, but these are black holes that are hundreds of solar masses, and they've long been postulated to exist, but um, we've never seen them. Uh, and this was the first time that we actually saw one of those objects. In this case, the, the final mass was 142 solar masses. The two input black holes, the, the two black holes that were spiraling together, are also kind of unique, particularly that heavier guy, the more massive guy, the guy that's 85 solar masses, because that black hole shouldn't exist by conventional um, methods for forming black holes, which is basically supernova explosions. All right, so if you if you if you do the theory of supernova explosions, it turns out that there's another gap where if um, uh, the star is massive enough, basically the supernova explosion just completely obliterates the star and everything goes off as basically uh, uh, ejecta into the thing. So there's nothing left behind to actually form a black hole through gravitational wave collapse. Well, this object with 85 solar masses is in that gap. So it actually suggests that there are other ways to form black holes. Uh, the one that's, I think, very interesting is that these could have come from uh, other black holes. So these could be second generation black holes, if you will. So um, maybe they were formed from smaller. So you're sort of started seeing this hierarchical formation of heavy mass black holes through the merger of light mass black holes. There are also other theories. One of the interesting ones might be that our understanding of nuclear physics and stars is in it's actually, this detection has actually gotten people to start to think about that. So, so these are the kinds of things that we can do. These are kinds of questions that we can, that we can answer. Okay, last couple of slides. Um, what's next? So, so uh, we, we're actually about to go into a new observing run starting, we hope, in March of next year. Uh, we'll be more sensitive. We expect to be able to detect uh, objects, black holes, maybe neutron stars, one per every day or two. Uh, so that's exciting. But it turns out that um, with a not so sophisticated uh, uh, change to our interferometer, we think we can actually see to the edge of the uh, of the universe uh, for all of the star form, all the stars that were ever formed. And the simple change you make, at least in concept, is just make the length longer. You remember at the beginning of the talk, I said it's all about the baseline. Well. In this case, there's no reason, you know, what's sacred about four kilometers, nothing. Uh, well, can we make a 10 kilometer uh, interferometer? Can we make a 40 kilometer long interferometer? And the answer is yes, we think we can. So we're in the process right now, uh, our, we have colleagues in Europe that are designing something called the Einstein telescope, very sophisticated interferometer underground, which has some advantages. In the US, we're focusing on something called Cosmic Explorer, which has 40 kilometer arms and basically, with this next, this would, these will require new uh, uh, construction. We, you know, we won't be able to modify our current interferometers because of where they're located. Uh, but with these new interferometers, we hope are operational at the uh, middle or end of next decade, the 2030s, um, we'll be able to see all the way back before stars form. So we'll be able to see the entire star forming universe with these new kinds of interferometers. And that's quite exciting. Um, finally, I'll point out that, that we, uh, in the ground-based gravitational wave world, look at high-frequency gravitational waves, the ones that I said are from a few hertz to uh, a few kilohertz. There are a whole number of sources and a whole number of detectors that actually look at um, uh, lower-frequency gravitational waves that go literally all the way down to frequencies uh, of attohertz. Uh, you know, basically, these are wavelengths that are comparable to... Uh, the scale of the universe. Uh, and there are different kinds of sources. The longest wavelengths, it's basically the Big Bang, 
relic radiation from the universe. Uh, you can look at supermassive black holes using uh, basically timing of pulsars. Very exciting experiment that's also supposed to be launched in, uh, in uh, 20, the 2030s is the laser interferometer space antenna. That's that object that's uh, uh, shown in space there as a triangle. That'll look for uh, uh, supermassive black holes and very massive black holes as well as for white dwarfs. So there's lots more going, that's going to happen here in the next uh, uh, in the next uh, decade and beyond. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, if you want to know more, there are a couple links there, and I think uh, they're on the webinar also. Uh, so we think this is really exciting, and um, stay tuned. So happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you very much, Dave, for that very exciting and very informative presentation. Uh, we do have a few questions already in the queue, in the Q&A system. Um, continue to submit questions if you have them. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple uh, quick technical uh, questions for Dave. Um, so one is, uh, for Dave, what impact do higher order cavity modes have on the on the performance or say the noise of the system? And how do you manage higher order cavity modes versus the desired TEM00 mode in the system? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we yeah, we actively work very hard to keep the mode quality of the laser in a zero zero mode. Um, in fact, the, we we actually utilize the fact that when the so these mirrors are suspended, which means you know they're sort of moving around and swinging. Now we control them. We have ways of controlling them that are non-contact using basically uh, capacitive uh, coupling and, and electromagnetic, um, basically uh, coupling using uh, solenoids. But um, the idea is that as the mirrors move around, they actually themselves produce higher order modes, mostly zero, one, and one zero. Uh, and by sensing those modes, we can actually feed back against the mirrors and um, correct them out and get rid of them. All right, that's the first order. We also actually can sense uh, 0220, which tells us something about how well we have mode matching in the uh, interferometer. But uh, uh, the real the question in, is really a good one because one of the things we've been wrestling with uh, really over the past five years is if we have... Um, uh, localized absorption on the mirrors due to the coatings. And we actually know that we actually have, turns out, even though these are great coatings, no coating is perfect. There's embedded particulates, uh, metal particulates in the mirrors that lead to a very high absorption, which actually change the surface figure of the mirror. And when that happens, that actually changes the mode structure of the uh, uh, mirror. And it turns out that the mode that actually we worry about is, it's a, a seven seven mode or something i don't remember exact but it's got a high mode index all right and we've actually we have ways of compensating using thermal lasers to actually try and correct out the those uh um, perturb mode perturbations and things like that a lot of the filter cavities that i talked about earlier are also used for basically cleaning up the laser mode. so there's a lot of work that we do to, to, to actually keep those lasers in pristine zero zero mode. all right cool and the related technical questions actually came up twice, um, so I'll, I'll push this one out. Uh, any advantages to going to alternative wavelengths? So one, just a quick uh, description of why 1064 was chosen. What would alternative wavelengths be that might be of interest? And uh, are there advantages, say, interferometrically to go into shorter wavelengths? Yeah, so certainly interferometrically, there's a big advantage. You know, you, you win by the, you know, the scaling of the wavelength. However, Pragmatically, there are lots of problems operating in shorter wavelengths. So suppose you want to go to the UV, for example. It's hard to get things that are not absorbed in the UV. One of the problems that we worried about, and this goes to the question of why we chose 1064, uh, is uh, even if you have a good vacuum, you don't have a perfect vacuum. And hydrocarbons, um, you know, these are objects that have atomic masses of you know, 100, 200, something like that, due to oil from, you know, that you can't get out of the, the, the system, can actually um, uh, played out on the, the surface of the mirrors. Uh, and we actually did experiments using green light, um, uh, using basically 532, before, actually when LIGO started going, it was using argon ion laser 514, that actually showed that even with great vacuum systems, over a period of time, your mirrors would decay. So that pushes you away from short 
uh, shorter uh, uh, wavelength. Uh, 1064 turns out to be very good because Fusilica is designed, you know, the telecommunications industry has refined uh, Fusilica to, you know, have very low absorption. And we just borrow from that uh, with our mirrors. Uh, so we have very low absorption substrate. Um, uh, there are other advantages. Uh, there's lots of technology that's been developed for 1064. For future generations, for some of the detectors that I talked about, uh, uh, the Einstein Telescope Cosmic Explorer, we're actually thinking about going to longer wavelengths, which you pay a penalty in terms of you know the phase. Um, you know, basically, the, the you split a fringe. You know, if the, the fringe if the fringe is twice as long, uh, you have to split it twice as hard to get to the same level of displacement. Uh, but there are other reasons for doing that. So, looking at two micron wavelengths, looking at uh, silicon mirrors and things like that. A lot of research is being built, is done there. It's not yet ready for, for deployment. So. Very nice. Uh, this is a timely question, kind of interesting. Um, do you foresee any impact that the James Webb Space Telescope would have on furthering the understanding of uh, gravitational waves or black holes in general? Or so is there any link up between LIGO and um, or LSC and the JWST? Yeah, I think there is. Um, so one of the one of our prime science goals when we detect objects that can be emitting in the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, you know, these colliding neutron stars, for example, um, if we can identify them quickly, if we can uh, identify them, you know, with enough precision that we can give the astronomers who operate any kinds of telescopes uh, a good you know, basically, we call it an error box. Basically, look, you know, a region in the sky where they we think the gravitational wave came from. They'll follow it up. Most of that follow up will happen using ground based OIR telescopes, actually, one meter, two meter, three meter class telescopes, 58 meter class telescopes. But if it can be, be identified quickly, then you can throw the big guns at it. You can throw Hubble at it, you can throw JWST at it. And if we do see something, a uh, binary neutron star, for example, in 04, that has an electromagnetic counterpart, it is, I would say, likely that uh, JWST would repoint, um, you know, and try and look at that uh, star over a couple of different periods to see its light curve. So I think JWST would would definitely add something to our uh, our follow up capability. Yeah, very nice. Um, a more general question that uh, just to, I think we'll clarify some points. Um, you know, does a gravitational wave observatory detect just any and all gravitational waves passing through its arms or can you aim it in some sense like a more traditional telescope? That's a great question. And I didn't, I usually have a slide on that. I didn't manage to sneak it in here. Um, but if you, if you think about um, the fact that gravitational waves go through everything and you ask what the antenna pattern of, I'm not sure I have it. Let me see if I, maybe I can see that. Unfortunately, I don't. Um, <laughs> if, if it basically, the interferometers are sensitive, are omnidirectional. They're sensitive to almost uh, any gravitational wave direction you're coming in. So there, there are a few dead bands, but they're they're limited depending on the polarization of the gravitational wave. So, so you can think of a gravitational wave detector as a um, microphone, more than a telescope. So the way we get position information is by using this network. We basically do triangulation by measuring the time of arrival difference. We measure the phase of the gravitational wave. We do that very carefully by measuring the difference in arrival time at the different detectors. We need at least three to get good localization, uh, that's where you get the position information. Now, so optics tells you that these gravitational waves are you know, tens of thousands and tens of thousands of kilometers in diameter. So there's a diffraction limit uh, that we have, and that's you know, limited by the wavelength. So we don't get, the best we can do is a few few degrees on the sky, which telescopes can do. Thank you for the explanation. Um... <clears throat> I'm probably going to do two more <laughs> since we're uh, running out of time and getting a lot of nice questions. Um, yeah, one was: Do we mainly do you mainly detect uh, black hole mergers because they're more massive or it's uh, a stronger signal? 
Um, why would you tend to see these more than, than say the Kilanova events or other potential events? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and the answer, the, the question actually uh, got the answer right. Uh, so because they're more massive, they're more efficient radiators, gravitational waves. So uh, to just give you a comparison, the first gravitational wave detection that we saw um, with these two uh, 30 solar mass-ish black holes, uh, in the final merger collision, about three solar masses was radiated away in gravitational waves. But in contrast, the neutron star is uh, a tiny fraction, I think a, a one fiftieth of a solar mass or less was radiated away. So, so they are more massive. They are uh, uh, therefore more better radiators, and because they're better radiators, and because we can, you know, our detector looks out over uh, amplitude, you know, looks at amplitudes. We just see a, fur, a much bigger volume of space with black holes. So the rates for black hole mergers and neutron star mergers, you know, to the level that we've measured them, are comparable. But we only see out to uh, uh, maybe 150, 200, 300 megaparsecs for neutron stars, whereas we see out to gigaparsecs for black holes. So they're just they're just more of them there. Yeah, very good. And I'll go with this last question here. Um, given the frequency of events, um, how do you pull specific events from sort of the background? Or if you had overlapping events or, or multiple events, what is the process just in general by which you would identify specific uh, gravitational wave signals? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I didn't talk about that at all. That's how we, the search stages. So we use the fact that the gravitational wave uh, from black holes and neutron star mergers is, is, is for the most part, uh, calculatable. You can actually use general relativity to calculate. So we generate uh, uh, what we call a template bank, hundreds of thousands of theoretical gravitational wave uh, signals that we actually use and cross correlate with the actual data. So the data comes in, it's mostly noise. Uh, every once in a while, a gravitational wave signal comes in. We actually, every data stream from all the detectors, we cross correlate hundreds of thousands of times with each of those different gravitational waveforms. And that's, that's something called match filtering, which your, your uh, audience may be familiar with. And match filtering allows us to you know, dig signals out of uh, noisy data. Then we have to actually uh, put some statistical confidence on it. There we do the same kind of analysis, but we do it uh, by time shifting the data so that um, you know, we know that gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. So we, we basically time shift our data to what we would call non-physical regimes, but we do the same cross correlation. And that allows us to put a, what we would call a false alarm rate or a probability. Yeah, very nice. No, thank you for that description. Well, I want to just thank Dave again for taking the time for giving this wonderful presentation today. Thank you also everyone who took the time to attend uh, the event. Um, so note on November 9th, we'll have an additional webinar on fluoride based optical fibers for the mid infrared. And that'll be presented by our very own uh, Dave Gardner from Thor Labs. And you can register for this event on our website at thorlab.com slash webinars. So again, just thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dave, for the fantastic presentation. And we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thanks.